Great. Well, thank you, Peter, and thanks, everybody, for sticking around. So uh, I've actually had quite a bit of fun putting together this talk. Um, it started out as pixels everywhere, but I really want to talk about how media technology has evolved and how it changed the world. And I want to tell you first about sort of what's happened over the last 20 years, and then a little bit what's happening, I think, in the next uh, 10 or 20 years. So I think the, one of the biggest things that has happened since I left grad school, I left grad school just about 20 years ago, 22 years ago, is that we have transformed media essentially from an analog to a digital form. And we've done that sort of basically through four stages, which I've identified here. And these I'm going to call traditional media. I'll talk about non-traditional media a little later. It started out with desktop publishing and printing. It went through digital audio, music, and radio. Uh, fairly recently, uh, digital photography has been converted from a film-based uh, media to a digital form. And literally, as we speak, uh, we're converting uh, video to HDTV and movies are going all digital. So I want to tell you a little bit about just the history of that, how it happened, uh, uh, and uh, what some of the implications of uh, that uh, trend is. Okay? So what I did is I just put together uh, four timelines of each of those transformations, and these are not meant to be historically precise timelines, but they include sort of things that I thought were like key events, both at the research level uh, and at the uh, sort of productization and commercialization level. And the dates along the bottom, and again, this is not meant to be uh, too precise. But of course, the first one that really hit was print. Uh, I graduated uh, in 1986. So uh, when I left school, I was able to print my dissertation on a laser printer, but most people really didn't have access to them. But you know, the printing technology that we just take for granted uh, every day started out with some fundamental research. I just listed a couple of the key ideas. That picture is actually a picture of John Warnock uh, while at Adobe. He was the founder of Adobe. Uh, he really came up with this fairly simple idea that you could take some ideas from uh, the CAD CAM industry, in particular the Bezier curve, which was designed to model automobiles, and use that to model fonts. And Adobe, as you remember, uh, they did the, uh, invented this technology called PostScript, and that technology was embedded in the Apple laser printer. And then very quickly, there was this sort of convergence of ideas from many different disciplines. Uh, programs like All This Page Maker uh, evolved. Around that time, Don Knuth also created the tech system, which we widely use in academic. And you know, uh, that was sort of the start of it, but you know, over a few, maybe 10 years, basically the entire industry, the print industry, switched from analog printing, mechanical processes, to uh, digital printing. And that's had a tremendous effect on those industries and how we communicate printed information. OK, sort of the next big one, I think, was audio. OK, I again throw out a few of the uh, just sort of things I thought were significant events. There's obviously a huge amount of research on digital signal processing that led up to this. Uh, uh, you know, CDs use this technique called Reed Solomon codes to prevent error detection. It's fairly, maybe not everybody knows about it, but you know, it's, it's a very old technique developed in the 60s. Um, but anyway, something like an example of a really uh, brilliant uh, innovation was there was a company called Soundstream, which spun out of the University of Utah. A guy named Don, uh, Tom Stockham uh, founded the company, and I still remember this very distinctly. He restored these old Caruso analog recordings and showed that you could play them back digitally and you could remaster them in a digital form. Uh, the MP3 standard, which now is, of course, ubiquitous, is not uh, that old. And there's been this sort of series of technologies, starting with optical CDs, then going to uh, uh, other streaming formats that use compression. MP3 is compressed, op in, uh, optical CDs are not compressed. And then sort of emerging, I think, sort of in full maturity, I think, although with sort of the iPod and the iTunes and the sort of uh, pervasive uh, ability to uh, share music and uh, uh, distribute music over the internet. Um, so, uh, so again, you sort of see this very typical sort of uh, tendency. You get these research ideas, these fundamental ideas, sort of gradually emerging into this ubiquitous uh, system. Now, fairly recently, uh, we've really had this radical change from film photography to digital photography. Again, I'm just throwing out some of the major developments here. Clearly, this is an area where hardware, and in fact, many of the areas of graphics, hardware is very important because we're dealing with producing physical 
stimuli, either light or ink or something like that. But the CCD imager uh, was developed in 1969. CMOS imager is actually a fairly recent invention at JPL in 1993. And there were these, all these software ideas. There was something called the discrete cosine transform that we use for image compression, digital paint systems. And then you sort of see this all sort of start coming together around 10 years ago when people started to be able to uh, uh, build uh, digital single lens reflex cameras. One of the first ones was Nikon, but all the vendors uh, followed that. And of course, those cost like $10,000 at the time. Uh, those have now dropped to under uh, $1,000, maybe $500. And essentially, film is out of business. I mean, Kodak is essentially, they still make film, but as everybody knows, there's far more um, uh, digital cameras sold these days than film cameras, and I think everybody, I actually consider this one of the great success stories of computer graphics and media. Uh, so this is literally sort of going on. I mean, I, I still you know, experience this, and I'll talk some more about it towards the end, but this ability to uh, take images with computers and manipulate them is just absolutely amazing. It's had a tremendous impact. And you've seen that in some of the other talks because of the media technology developed for uh, these applications, you see this uh, widely used in science, sensing, and so on, because we've been able to uh, make these devices cheap and ubiquitous. The third one I mentioned, traditional media-wise, is TV and the movies. And again, a fairly uh, uh, similar story. I do want to make one point here is that, you know, uh, this was actually much harder to do, sort of from a public policy point of view. Um, Really what spurred everybody into action was a demo of NHK in 1969 where they demonstrated an analog HD TV system. And this caused quite a flurry of activity resulting in something called the Grand Alliance, which some of you may remember, which was really like a moon, mini moon race. The moon race was basically, could you develop an all digital HD TV system that used the same amount of bandwidth uh, as a conventional TV channel? And nobody knew how to do that. And it took actually quite a while. In fact, the, uh, they invented this thing called motion compensated image compression, um, still at MIT, uh, Sarnoff, Bell Labs, and so on. And uh, that was really the key. And that compressed HDTV down to about 1.5 megabits per second. And you know that was just uh, quite an amazing sort of time because nobody knew how to do it. There was sort of the space race kind of thing is could you do it or not, and a lot of uncertainty about what would actually happen. And then that's how we, when we ratified the ATSC uh, standard. Now, you know, it's sort of interesting, even now you look at the timeline on that, that's about 10 years ago when that standard was ratified. I, you know, everybody probably remembers just recently, uh, Congress delayed the end of analog broadcast. Yet one more time, there's been a series of this. And people are still broadcasting in analog. But literally, I mean, as I, if I read the uh, legislation right, on June 12th, I think that will be the final end of it and analog broadcasts will want and in the United States. Um, now, um, and then you also have other interesting devices like TiVo. Now, at the same time along with this was a lot of work on computer graphics. Andy Van Dam is here. He led a major research effort, uh, uh, which was an NSF-funded science and technology center on computer graphics and visualization. And that actually sort of led to this other parallel thing, and that and other work in industry, obviously, we did work at Pixar, into the first computer aided computer, first full-length uh, feature film generated by a computer. I worked on that film. Now, when I started in this, I should actually mention just a personal anecdote here. When I started working in graphics in the 80s, uh, I actually picked this problem of doing a compute, computer generated film because I didn't think I would ever be able to do it in my lifetime. <laughs> I basically said, uh, it, to me, I came from artificial intelligence. To me, it was like artificial intelligence. Could you completely create a world that was so, it was indistinguishable from the real world that you could show somebody and they would think it was plausible? And I figured that will never happen in my lifetime, so I'm guaranteed uh, something to work on uh, all my career. Uh, so it's sort of an interesting fact that we actually solved that problem in that fairly little time. I mean, it went, you know, the work started before I started working on, but uh, it is sort of remarkable that 
uh, were able to do that. And movies haven't completely been connect, converted to computers, as you probably all know, sort of one of the final steps, which we'll probably see unfold in the next five years or so, is 3D digital projectors installed in all the movie theaters, which will in some sense complete that part of that puzzle. I mean, there's a few more interesting things. So I mean, that's just sort of a very rapid summary of this. But it's actually you know, quite interesting sort of case study in a lot of different aspects of technology, and some of which I think people in computer science and sort of underestimate. So first let me just make one observation, is really, you know, media is, uh, involves a lot of data. And if you look at the order in which we've been able to convert things to digital form, it's largely determined by the processing power or the network bandwidth or the storage that we have available. And as Moore's Law has caught up to uh, various levels, we're able to do it. So, you know, audio takes much less bandwidth than uh, video. So we were able to do audio before uh, video. But that also lets us sort of predict a lot of these things, right? Because we can see what the audio people do and what happens when audio gets converted before we see the video. So we've all heard of all the sharing problems with audio and the bit torrents of the world and, and DRM issues. They all emerged in audio before they emerged in video, but we expect, obviously, that they'll all come back in video. And imagine how disruptive audio was to the music industry. You can imagine similar disruptions. In fact, we see, starting to see them already uh, going on in the video industries, uh, video-based industries, because they have a hard time adapting to this. Uh, the second thing I wanna, uh, point I want to make is that, you know, because media is so ubiquitous, it often drives a lot of the technologies that we actually become sort of our COTS technology, the commercial technology that becomes really cheap. You know, I mentioned CD, DVD, flash memory, and the iPod. Those are just examples of how some of our most common storage technologies really were driven by medias. Uh, similar things in networking. I was talking to people at uh, Google about the load on their network due to YouTube. It's tremendous. And even now, I think people are estimating more than 50% of all the data we collect could be images and video. And then finally, in processing, um, GPUs and media processors have now become the supercomputers of our age because of the demands of media. So uh, there's quite a bit of repercussions on media throughout computing, uh, and we often are driven by media applications. Now, I purposely sort of picked traditional media and the sort of digitization to start with, but I think um, what's even more interesting, of course, is the emergence of what I call new media. And I'm not going to go through this in much detail, but, you know, it's sort of a simple game plan to sort of try to digitize analog media. But, of course, where the creativity comes is once you sort of get that base infrastructure to re-express it in many different forms. Now, I'm not going to go through all these, but, you know, uh, once we were able to uh, develop uh, basic uh, digital photography, then things like Flickr or photo tourism uh, emerge, or uh, and same with video, YouTube emerged. And once we were able to get the basic 3D graphics, then you start getting things like Google Earth and Second Life and World of Warcraft. And again, the same thing with printing. Now the big rage is electronic books. So I don't want to just paint the story that, you know, you just want to emulate traditional media, but there is this sort of baseline that we've established by being able to do it, which has had a tremendous uh, uh, impact on where we can go. And to me, it's sort of a golden age is starting to occur, similar to what Chris said, is now we've gotten almost all the world converted over to digital media, and now imagine everything we can do now that that's happened. Because now we can mix it and match it both within itself and across itself and with other kinds of apps, and that's uh, causing a real revolution. So anyway, that was just sort of meant, you know, a really quick sort of summary of some of these trends, but I haven't seen written up. Somebody should write a book on this. I think it's quite interesting transformation in the last 25 years. Um, okay, so I just want to end by just picking sort of four, so I've said, well, that's sort of what happened in the past. Just want to give you like four big themes or research trends that are sort of going on in the media and graphics community right now, and they're all really quite exciting, and I think they'll have equivalent large impacts. So the four I picked was supercomputers on a chip, literally the reinvention of cameras and photography, building planetary scale virtual worlds, and new interaction devices. So this has been mentioned multiple times already, is GPUs have really become massive parallel processors. 
I mean, basically, because of the demands of media and computer graphics and simulating the world and computing with all this data, the only way to do it in real time so people can experience it is to involve a lot of processing. And a typical chip, this is an existing chip, has 240 cores in it. So most of the chips we use on our desktop have two cores in them. And this thing is a multiple teraflop device. And again, it just, it just was sort of generated by demand because of the uh, processing requirements of graphics. Uh, but, you know, uh, this, as I said, has become such a powerful compute platform that people are now trying to extend it into all sorts of other applications uh, beyond graphics and media. And I worked on a project at Stanford called Folding at Home uh, where we were trying to use it to simulate protein, protein folding with Vijay Pandey. Uh, so you can take these architectures, they're fairly general purpose, and you can uh, do a lot of calculation on it. But more fundamentally what it's done is it's completely changed how people view uh, architectures. And now I think everybody knows there's this huge problem in computer science of programming many core devices. We're going to have GPU-like devices with thousands of cores in the next year or two, and we're going to have to figure out both how to build those things and how to program those things. And this is, as you know, one of the biggest problems now in computer science because it's quite disruptive because people used to not have to change the way they program in order to get better performance. So anyways, graphics and has obviously dri driven a lot of this. The next thing I just want to show you is a project I worked on, uh, which is a fairly simple idea but inspired by uh, the uh, progress in digital photography. Uh, but the basic idea was Suppose you take a camera and it has a glass lens, and suppose you could build a digital lens. In other words, what a normal lens does is bend light so you can focus an image, okay, so you get the subject focused on the photo sensor. But suppose the photo sensor just got more and more uh, pixels in it to the point that it had 100 million pixels, way beyond what any resolution that you could ever print is. Well, could you use those pixels in some other way? So suppose what you did is you actually built little tiny cameras in the photo sensor which actually recorded the light coming from different directions. So you basically built a digital hologram. And once you built a digital hologram, what you can do is you essentially have captured all the light coming from all the directions. In software, you can sort of mix the light around, change it, refocus it. In fact, what we were able to show, and, and the way we did this was, was with a small array of lenses that literally made itty bitty cameras on top of the big sensor. Um, and what we showed basically was that you could take a process like focusing, which involved moving lenses back and forth, and actually completely do it in software. Okay, two minutes. So anyways, this just shows some examples of how you can refocus in software. And I've shown photographers this and lens designers in this, and they're just completely stunned that this is even possible. But this kind of thing, and there's a lot of people in the world now thinking about this, has completely changed how people are thinking about cameras. So imagine, you know, cameras, we just completely change how we think about them, all the implications of that. Um, so that's sort of an interesting area of research. One example that my colleague Mark Lavoie is doing is he's shown that you can build a microscope with this technology. And so you can build a lot of the optics of the microscope actually in uh, software. The, the third area I just want to briefly mention is uh, virtual worlds. I think one of the driving problems in graphics right now is trying to build a planetary scale virtual world. And by planetary scale, it means like some, you know, place that you could literally, people, every person on the planet could be participating in, it would do complete simulation of what's going on, and you could wander around and interact and communicate with other people. And these are just examples of research projects. This is not technology that really exists, but it's sort of like a grand challenge problem in our field. And this is really interesting and really hard. So for example, uh, I'm working with Phil Levis, who's here. You know, how do you build an operating system for such a thing like this? It's extremely difficult. I, I think of it as sort of web 10.0. How can you have real-time response between all these objects in the virtual world? How can you scale this to 100 billion objects? How can you make it robust and secure? But then more at the graphics level, level there's how do you simulate physics across the world? And in fact, how do you even simulate ecosystems or social networks and all the other things that John Kleinberg said. And finally, this becomes sort of the ultimate laboratory for doing social science research, and already people are starting to do social science research in the virtual world. And so there might be a, a lot to learn from uh, by recording what people are doing in interesting ways. 
Finally, I'll just end up, as the third, fourth one I just picked was new types of interactive devices. Uh, another colleague of mine at Stanford uh, developed this application called the Ocarina for the iPhone. I don't know if anybody has seen this application, but the iPhone is famous for having multi-touch display and it has integrated sound processing and a microphone, and you can play this like an ocarina, or, and you can play music on it. And of course, this is, if you, you may have seen this, it's obviously generated an enormous amount of uh, publicity. But really, I think what's happening is that people are starting to rethink how we interact with these devices. The way I think of it is, like, uh, imagine, well, what you really want is computers where most of the processing has to do with sensing and relatively little processing has to do with output. Like, if you think of us, if we were, like, blind chameleons, we'd be more like a computer. We could change the color of our skin really effectively, but we couldn't see anything. And so the computers we have now are like blind chameleons. They can't see anything about what's around them, but they're really good at changing the color of their skin. So the question is, how do you build these devices that can sense what the people are doing in really interesting ways that work uh, for them, in this case, like playing the instrument? And there's a lot of really brilliant ideas going on here. For example, here's a project from Microsoft where what they actually did is they took a display and built in a sensor right behind the display. So not only does it emit light, but it also senses where your hand is reflecting light right on top of the display. So you can literally see the person's hand as well as generating the light. And that just now starts to sort of change completely the balance from input to output and might lead to all sorts of interesting new user interfaces. So I guess I'm running out of time, but thank you very much.